getting drugs off the streets of central Indiana. Retailers selling synthetic marijuana to customers despite the fact that it's illegal. How local law enforcement are taking a new approach to this problem. Plus, all eyes on the Democrats. How they made their case following the Republican National Convention and what our political insiders have to say about the president's message to voters. It's all coming up on this edition of Indianapolis This Week. From RTV6, Indianapolis This Week. Making it illegal hasn't stopped it. Statewide busts haven't stopped it. And the sales of synthetic marijuana continue at convenience stores. State leaders are on a new effort to crack down on those retailers selling the drugs. RTV6 reporter Rafael Sanchez has more on the new plan to deal with these sales. Products like these are what authorities want to purge from store shelves. The substances are known as K2 spice or bath salts. Though illegal to sell, the top doctor with the State Department of Health says emergency rooms continue to see users. They um, smoke them, they ingest them, they inhale them, and, um, and they cause um, side effects that uh, emergency physicians have not seen previously. We're not really sure what the long-term effects of using these substances are. That's on the mind of the state's attorney general, who's teaming up with police and prosecutors statewide. Greg Zeller's office is sending letters to convenience stores warning them that they could lose their business license for a year if they sell any of the banned drugs. Retailers that voluntarily turn over illegal inventory will get one chance to come clean and avoid any civil penalties. Now's a good time to voluntarily hand over uh, these dangerous products and you've already heard how dangerous so uh, if you're if you're looking to try to get your money back by selling it you're making a mistake the Marion County prosecutor also drafted a letter informing retailers of the current law he says a few dozen stores in Indianapolis continue to sell K2 and spice or similar substances using different names the prosecutor says he's willing to give stores seven days as of today to get into compliance. If uh, any retail outlet's willing to surrender uh, those products to the, to the police, then, then we will not prosecute them. In Indianapolis, Rafael Sanchez, RTV6. Now, Chris Prophet recently sat down with one of those heading up this initiative, Marion County Prosecutor Terry Curry, to talk about this latest push and much more. Mr. Curry, thank you so much for being with us sure. today. We appreciate it. First of all, let's talk about the problem of synthetic marijuana and also bath salts. It's been a serious issue. Um, sales in convenience stores, why do you think this is an ongoing problem? What are you doing to stop it? Right. It is a significant problem, not only here, but uh, across the country. And Indiana, like a lot of uh, other jurisdictions, have had problems figuring out how to address it. And uh, what we have learned and what occurs is that clearly our legislature has passed uh, criminal statutes to make it illegal to sell these substances. Um, but because they are synthetic, uh, they're made up of a particular a molecular composition and what uh, we have learned is that the labs where this is being manufactured, probably outside uh, the country, uh, are uh, staying one step ahead of those definitions and so by merely changing uh, in some slight degree the molecular composition of these synthetic drugs, whether it's spice or bath salts or others, uh, they take it outside the current definition and, and, are, and therefore is not currently criminal. And so what are you doing to try and stop that. Right. Now, what we did this week is in conjunction with the Indiana Attorney General announced a joint initiative. Uh, first of all, from the Attorney General's perspective, um, they have the ability to pursue civil remedies and uh, fundamentally under the guise of, of any retailer cannot sell a dangerous substance. And so they're not bound by the, the, the restrictions of, of the criminal definition. If a substance is, or product is dangerous, they will pursue civil remedies, including forfeiture of their retail license. From our perspective of the prosecutor's office, there are criminal statutes that make it illegal to sell a lookalike substance or to sell a substance that's represented to be a controlled substance. Uh, from our perspective, that latter provision we be, believe applies. And so we have set in motion this week delivering letters to every single retailer uh, in the nature of uh, gas stations, head shops, smoke shops, through our police department are going to hand deliver the letters in Marion County, putting them on notice that we don't care uh, if this substance is on your shelf 
and whether it meets the definition or not, we're going to prosecute it as a sale of a substance represented to be. Clearly, if we see substances and they meet the definition, they're going to be prosecuted in and of itself. But again, we want to stay one step ahead of the continuing evolution of the product. We want to go to the Officer Bassard case. And the latest ruling on this second vial of blood in the case came down this week to have the vial tested here in Marion County instead of it going to an independent lab in Texas. Are you okay with that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, what had occurred was that uh, uh, we had obviously made arrangements and sought the court's approval, which was granted to have that additional test um, done in the Texas lab. Uh, the defense raised some objections to that based upon the cost. Uh, obviously, it was going to be a cost to our office to do it. But in addition, uh, if they would send their own expert, it was going to be a cost to the defendant. They raised some objections to that. And what the uh, court determined was uh, that any additional testing, whether it's of the second vial or the first vial, uh, could be done in the Marion County lab, which is fine with us. It's a nationally certified lab, and we have full confidence in our lab. What about public safety? You know, Marion County facing this budget crisis, and a lot of it, the focus has rightfully been on public safety. How do you see that affecting your job and your office? It, it clearly affects uh, our office uh, in a direct basis. Number one, obviously, we have our own budget, which we, we need to be very careful about you know, how we spend the dollars allocated to us. More importantly, we see the effect uh, in terms of the cases that are brought to our office. Uh, we are seeing the, the um, uh, various divisions being uh, reduced in terms of their manpower of our police departments. Uh, an example would be uh, domestic violence where uh, they continue to reduce the force just because there's not sufficient officers available to do it. So we, we are participating in those discussions to see how uh, we can better allocate our total public safety resources, whether that involves the Sheriff's Department, IMPD, or other jurisdictions in the city, uh, because we certainly don't want anything to fall through the cracks because of this problem. You're confident that we can work this out in terms of filling this gap, if you will? I, I think uh, certainly, uh, based upon the discussions we're having, I think we can find some short-term solutions. Uh, and but, but again, I think ultimately we have to keep in mind those are short-term, and, and we've got to give serious thought to how we solve this problem in the long term in terms of getting our departments, all of our departments, back up to adequate manpower so that we can ensure the safety of, uh, of folks in Marion County. And Marion County Prosecutor Terry Curry, thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been another big week in the presidential race with the Democratic National Convention. After the break, we're sitting down with our political insiders to talk about what worked, what didn't, and how the president's message is playing with voters. Now a sprint to November between President Obama and Mitt Romney. Both conventions have wrapped up with the president delivering his message to voters. Take a look at part of what he had to say. But know this, America. Our problems can be solved. Our challenges can be met. The path we offer may be harder, but it leads to a better place. And I'm asking you to choose that future. I'm asking you to rally around a set of goals for your country. Goals in manufacturing, energy, education, national security, and the deficit. Real, achievable plans that will lead to new jobs, more opportunity and rebuild this economy on a stronger foundation. That's what we can do in the next four years, and that is why I am running for a second term as President of the United States. All right, joining us now, two of our political insiders, Robert Vane and Laura Beck. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank welcome you. back from the RNC. Thank you very much. It was a good time. Thank All you. All right, good to have you back. We'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk about the DNC and your impressions of, of how they did. Well, they obviously had, I think, an on balance a good convention. I mean, just as a political hack, not mm -hmm. necessarily a Republican at this moment, I, I think it pr pretty relatively well for them. Uh, they obviously had some issues with their platform. I don't think you ever want to have delegates in the, in the chairman of the convention yelling at each other over whether God should be in the platform or what's the capital of Israel. So, and booing them. And booing, and booing the mention of God, which they did. We're which a big is tent. Classic. We're a big tent. Uh, anyway. This is typical All distraction. Huh? This is totally distraction tactics. That's a winning we part of your our, platform. That we must have uh, had a really good convention of this is the kind of stuff they're putting out. Well, right but now. if you're talking about just how the convention's going to go, you certainly don't want that sort of thing. Uh, I thought they were so some uh, decent speeches. I think Tammy Duckworth's speech, a uh, mm -hmm. lady out of uh, Illinois, was a fantastic. She's obviously an inspirational person. So that's my uh, a not, not, not necessarily so partisan take on it. 
the partisan side of me would say that it was obviously much more difficult for the president to give the sort of speech that he needed to give this go around because in 08 he was a two year or however long he was United States senator with basically no record and now he has a record on economic issues that is nothing short of abysmal it's a lot tougher to be soaring when the economy is tanking Look, I didn't think it was truly one of President Obama's best speeches. Uh, do you think he did what he needed to, or, or did you think it was his best speech? Well, I think if you were looking for soaring rhetoric, then that wasn't the speech for you. Uh, but I think if you wanted to know where he wants to go with the economy and what he's doing, and when you really look at it, going back four years ago to when the financial market crashed and essentially the world was blowing up and ending um, at least in the financial markets he really took us down the path of all the different things that we've had to do and made I think an effective case for he needs four more years to get it done it took FDR three terms to dig us out of the the depression so he needs some more time and I think he made an effective case he had a lot of very very good information in there that I think uh, resonated with people and when you looked around and you saw that convention hall um, it was a uh, wonderful mosaic of America I think a lot of people were excited to see President Clinton there speaking mm -hmm. but did he speak too well? Did he overshadow uh, President Obama? Well, I don't think you ever overshadow the President of the United States. I mean, Barack yeah. Obama is the President. Clinton is obviously a very effective communicator, had a terrific economic record, had some luck, but you know, all presidents do. Um, but this election is all about, in my view, even more than the health care, which is still unpopular, health care law, Obamacare, is about the economy. If the unemployment rate was at 5 or 6 percent right now, Barack Obama would be up 15 to 20 points easy. Mm -hmm. The reason it is close, even in an evenly divided country, is because the economy is doing so badly. Job numbers come out, came out again on Friday, more bad news. We were told when the stimulus was passed that unemployment would never hit 8%. It hasn't fallen below 8%. That recovery summer was supposed to be last summer, not this summer. These economic numbers are terrible for the administration and his re-election effort. And Mitt Romney has taken hold of that. He said that uh, uh, President Obama hardly mentioned jobs in the economy, and he said these latest numbers um, give him, Romney, confidence that the president uh, doesn't really know what he's doing. Well, I think that's funny coming from Mitt Romney, um, especially uh, given his record um, on, uh, on economic issues as well. But what I think is interesting about Mitt Romney is it's easy to throw stones. However, Mitt Romney gave no specifics in his speech on how he would grow the economy. I mean, he spent a lot of time introducing himself and telling people what a wonderful guy he is. Uh, but he didn't spend a lot of time really drilling down to the numbers and really drilling down to strategies that I think the Democrats did. And, and as you watch the convention this last week, what was really empowering powerful and impactful were how all of the speakers led up to President Obama talking about where we were, where we're going, where they came from, and how we can all work together. And one of the things that I think that was stressed so strongly is the importance of bipartisanship. And President Obama has been blocked at every single turn by congressional Republicans who refuse to work with him. So I think you have to also take that into account. And, you know, Bill Clinton was loving on Republicans. Which I, I think some have said that's what the president needed to include in his uh, speech is mm -hmm. we're going to have to work together a little bit more in order to get anything done. You can't mm -hmm. do the this first, by one part. The first two years of Barack Obama's presidency, the Democrats controlled everything. That's how they got the stimulus through, no Republican votes. That's how they got Obamacare no Republican through, votes, right. no Republican votes. Right. They didn't need Republicans. And according to a new book by Bob Woodward, when asked about the fact that Republicans were, had problems with the stimulus bill in the Affordable Care Act, Rahm Emanuel, the president's chief of staff, used an expletive to say, the heck with them. So we don't need them. We have the votes. That was the attitude. Barack Obama came in and told a bunch of congressional Republicans, I won. They didn't want Republican help. So you can't complain about it now that you didn't get it. All right, congressional, let's leave it there. Congressional Republicans had a meeting the weekend, the inauguration, saying they were not going to work with him. Good. All right. We're going to talk about the RNC. <laughs> More from our political panel with their take on the RNC right after the break. What is needed in our country today is not complicated or profound. It doesn't take a special government commission to tell us what America needs. What America needs is jobs, lots of jobs. And there you have part of Mitt Romney's message at the RNC to convince the American people to elect him president. Uh, Robert, you were over there. Let's start with you actually first. Uh, what did you think of Mitt Romney's speech? I thought his speech did exactly what it needed to do. Most people still don't know who he is. He talked a little bit about his background. He talked a lot about the economy. That is the central issue. Another thing that's very interesting is 
there's a lot of coverage, a lot of sentiment that the Republican Party is somehow on the outs, and, and the Democrats have the White House, so you know you're all the, you're the opposition. Mm -hmm. But since Barack Obama won in 2008, the Republican Party in this country and in Indiana has has had an unbroken string of victories. We have more governors now than we had, more members of the Senate, more members of the House. So. Mitt Romney has got a wonderful base to work on, and the energy was there because there were a lot of newly elected representatives and members of Congress and governors who were at that convention. So two months until election, he's still introducing himself? Is that what you thought he tried to do, and did he do it, and did he succeed? I, I, I'm, I'm going to be fairly biased against Mitt Romney, obviously. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll just I hope be so, frank because there. you're on the other side. I'll just be frank there, but um, I don't think he made an effective case for why he should be president. I don't think yeah. he's made an effective case at all. Um, I think there were other speakers who were far better than him. Marco Rubio, for example, I thought was, was really good and, and really a, a solid speaker, as was former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Um, but at the end of the day, what people were talking about after that convent, after his speech, uh, was the Clint Eastwood um, implosion on national television. So people weren't even listening to the speech because they were so busy Googling and watching Clint Eastwood on YouTube immediately after it happened. But at the end of the day, I, I really think that um, Mitt Romney really should be a little further ahead in where he's laying things out right now. Each side had their own fiascos. That is still getting talked about, the uh, Clint Eastwood and the empty chair, Robert. Were you on hand for that specific moment when that was. happened? I was. You're, what did you think of that when he I first would say up? this, I, and I wrote about this, and uh, Laura and I both uh, write monthly columns for a uh, publication here in the city. Uh, his, his presentation didn't match his presence. His presence was uh, unbelievable. And I don't know, though, he could have. The buildup, I mean, people were talking about it constantly. But he did have one of the best lines in the convention. If someone doesn't do the job, you got to let them go. And clearly on the economy, Barack Obama has not done the job based on what Barack Obama said would be happening at this time. Mm -hmm. Someone also should have probably combed Clint's hair. That would have been Combs. probably <laughs> important as well. I couldn't focus on anything else. In the 20 hair. seconds we have left, any other high points or low points of either convention? Michelle Obama. A high point. High point. She gave it. Yeah. She did. She did give a very good speech. Yeah. I thought that. Uh, and Romney right. gave a great speech. That lady, you know, she gets a lot of abuse, especially from the left-wing freaks on the net. But she has been Are through a lot: yet? breast cancer, multiple <laughs> sclerosis. That's tough. actually you're both finished. Thank you both though, for joining us, uh, Lauren. I'll tell Thank Marco you, you like you. the speech. And make sure to stay up to date on uh, political news anytime by following our insiders, Laura, Robert, Kip, and Abdul, on our Capital Watch blog. You can find the link on our webpage, theindychannel.com. And after the break, I talk one-on-one -on -one with ABC's Katie Kirk. Tomorrow begins a very exciting time for us here at RTV6 because Katie Couric is kicking off her new daytime talk show. A lot of work goes into a show like that, including shooting segments all around the country. One of those shoots brought her to Indianapolis, and as you'll see, I was able to sit down with her backstage before her big debut. Ask any Jimmy Buffett fan or parrot head, as they call themselves, and they'll tell you the man who sings about margaritas and cheeseburgers in paradise is all about having a good time. And he likes to surprise his fans with special guests. Think he has any surprises for you? Oh, I, you know, he always has surprises. A surprise? What are you talking about? No, I've never seen any surprises. No, like surprise guests or anything like that? Nope, never seen a surprise guest here. Not in Indiana, at least. Katie Couric, welcome to Indiana. Many people are brave enough to do what Katie did when Jimmy Buffett and his Coral Reefer band performed at Klipsch Music Center this summer. For one day, Katie became a referent. Katie's performance with Jimmy is one of her YOLOs. YOLO, You Only Live Once, is going to be a big part of her new daytime talk show. I thought this would just be a fun, you know, very visual kind of uh, little fling for me. And it happened to be in Indianapolis, so here I am again. Um, you mentioned fling. Another one of your YOLOs, George Clooney? Oh, that was a joke. You know, people took that seriously. I think he's actually taken, and I'm going to take him officially off my YOLO list. Breaking news, Clooney is off Katie's YOLO list. Sorry, George. The former Today Show host and groundbreaking network news anchor told me her new talk show might include a segment on middle-aged dating, but she'll also include more serious topics, especially if she can make a difference. So if I have an opportunity to actually do something that saves lives, well, bring it. I'm, I'm in. And bring it she is. Some credit her fill-in appearance on ABC's Good Morning America earlier this year with helping to send GMA over the top in the ratings 
Women's War with the Today Show, knocking Today out of first place for the first time in 16 years. You feel like you got the ball rolling? I mean, no, not at all. No, I don't. I take no credit for that whatsoever. I think, no, no, no. You know, I just was happy to pitch in. Katie doesn't have much time for fill-in hosting these days as she crisscrosses the country, shooting segments for her show and encouraging fans to share their own YOLOs. Thanks to Katie, I fulfilled one of my YOLOs when I got to meet Jimmy backstage before a show. How did Katie do as a backup singer? Well, at sound check, uh, it's obvious she rehearsed. <laughs> so I told her to have just one little small shot of tequila to get the jitters away, but to pace herself. So I think we're in good shape here. Uh, we may, the biggest problem may be getting her off the tour. Not to worry, Jimmy. The thing about a YOLO is, it's only one time. Uh, could reefer at number three kind of come out here, please? Oh, that would be Katie Couric over there, wouldn't it, huh? Although if the crowd is any indication, Katie might be called back for an encore. Some people play. And remember to join us Monday at 3 for the premiere of Katie right here on RTV6. And that's it for this edition of Indianapolis This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Todd Connor. Have a great day.